Did you know that the heart can have a direct effect on swallowing, voice, and cognition? One of the many reasons I'm so passionate about promoting medical ed education in the SLP field is because of how whole body our work really is. I personally didn't take any courses until recently that were dedicated to the cardiovascular system and how changes to the anatomy and physiology of the heart can impact my clinical investigations. SLPs are sorely needed in the cardiovascular ICU, which may come as a surprise to most people. Today, I'm going to discuss how these three domains of our field, swallowing, voice, and cognition, can be impacted by the heart and what SLPs can do about it. Let's dive in. I'm Teresa Richard. I've been a medical speech pathologist for 15 years. I'm a board certified specialist in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I'm the founder and CEO of the MedSLP Collective and MedSLP Education. Number one, the cardiovascular system and swallowing. A study in 2020 found that 46% of individuals with cardiovascular disease who were admitted to a hospital presented with some degree of swallowing impairment, nearly half. And that's just looking at cardiovascular disease alone. Surgery and anatomic variances can also cause dysphagia. There are two key things to understand about the positioning of the heart. First, the esophagus is directly behind the heart. Second, the recurrent laryngeal nerve loops around the aortic arch as it courses back up to its innervation site in the vocal folds. The heart's positioning and close contact with the esophagus and recurrent laryngeal nerve risk causing dysphagia when anatomical variances, surgery, and cardiac disease come into the clinical picture. Examples of types of dysphagia caused by anatomical variances include cardiovascular dysphagia, dysphagia lusoria, and dysphagia aortica. Don't worry, I'll go over each one next. Starting with cardiac dysphagia or dysphagia megalotriensis, this is a mechanical dysphagia caused by esophageal compression from an enlarged left atrium. Common signs and symptoms include dysphagia for solids, weight loss in more severe cases, cardiomegaly or enlarged heart, and congestive heart failure. The most serious complication is atrioesophageal fistula, which can result in fatal vomiting of blood. Treatment is necessary only if symptomatic. Dietary and compensatory strategies may be effective in mild cases, and surgical intervention may be recommended in moderate to severe cases. Next is dysphagia lusoria. This is another mechanical dysphagia, but caused by an aberrant or rogue right subclavian artery that's behind the esophagus, causing extrinsic compression of the esophagus. Basically, the subclavian artery is pushing against the back of the esophagus. This is an embryologic abnormality of the aortic arch. Here's an interesting bit of history about dysphagia lusoria. First discovered in 1794, it was originally described as dysphagia by freak of nature. Definitely not something you hear every day. Common signs and symptoms include dysphagia for solids and pill-induced esophagitis, secondary to the extrinsic compression of the subclavian artery and chest pain. So what can be done about it? Depends on the severity of the symptoms. Lifestyle and dietary changes, compensatory strategies like alternating solids and liquids are considered for mild to moderate symptoms and surgical correction may be considered for severe cases when all other therapeutic attempts fail. Now let's look at dysphagia aortica. This is the third and final mechanical dysphagia I'll talk about caused by altered heart anatomy. Dysphagia aortica can occur when an enlarged or tortuous or aneurysmal aorta compresses onto the distal esophagus. Common signs and symptoms include dysphagia for solids, including retention of bolus in the esophagus, weight loss, abdominal fullness, and nausea. As with other mechanical dysphagia I've discussed, treatment options depend on the severity of the symptoms. Diet and lifestyle modifications for mild cases, such as small meals and softer foods, can be considered, and surgical intervention might be considered for severe cases like separation of the esophagus from the aorta or aneurysm repair. While these mechanical dysphagias related to heart anatomy might not be the most common thing you see, you are more likely to encounter dysphagia related to cardiac surgery. One study by Plowman and colleagues found that up to 94% of patients after cardiac surgery experience some degree of swallowing dysfunction, and 29% of patients with post-op dysphagia were found to be aspirating, half of which were silently aspirating. Research has also found that bedside assessments, including the three ounce water test, have poor sensitivity to dysphagia and aspiration in this population. So an instrumental swallow study is absolutely warranted. Common cardiothoracic surgeries include valve repair replacement, coronary bypass, and coronary artery bypass grafting. 
C-A-B-G, or cabbage. Dysphagia can occur for multiple reasons, including nerve damage or severing, intubation time, deconditioning, endotracheal tube size, and intraoperative transesophageal echocardiography, or TEE. TEE is a procedure that creates a picture of a patient's heart using sound waves. The echo transducer that produces the sound waves for TEE is attached to a thin tube that passes through the mouth, down the throat, and into the esophagus. TEE may be an independent risk factor for dysphagia post-cardiac surgery. Per Rousseau and colleagues, the mechanisms of dysphagia that could result from TEE use remain unclear. We can only hypothesize that trauma during its insertion or use and or compression of pharyngoesophageal tissues between the TEE probe and the endotracheal tube may contribute to this complication. One quick note about cardiothoracic surgery and nerve damage, Surgery from the left side is associated with increased risk of vocal fold paralysis and dysphagia related to incomplete airway protection because the recurrent laryngeal nerve loops around the aortic arch, which sits on the left. So when you read the post-op notes, make sure to see which side the surgery was performed on. We've had multiple members of the MedSLP Collective share their case studies, questions, and wins when it comes to cardiac conditions and dysphagia. And most of these have been pretty eye-opening. One SLP shared her win about a younger patient she saw who complained of difficulty with solids and feeling like food was getting stuck in her chest. She was referred for a VFSS and thankfully this SLP was able to get optimal images, including AP view and esophageal sweep. She and the radiologist did notice what appeared to be slower bolus transit in the thoracic region of the esophagus. But it wasn't until this SLP reviewed the images later that she noticed what she described as a small indentation in the esophagus, right where barium appeared to hang around. She brought this up to the radiologist, who actually had seen this before and was the first to suggest dysphagia lusoria. Sure enough, they found that this patient's right subclavian artery was actually on the left side of her heart and coursing behind the esophagus, causing that compression they saw on imaging. The patient received appropriate referrals to discuss her options, and ultimately she decided to start by altering her diet and trying compensatory strategies like smaller bites, alternating solids and liquids, and eating smaller meals more frequently throughout the day. Now let's look at the cardiovascular system and voice. Similar to swallowing, voice can be impacted by the heart's anatomy or cardiothoracic surgery due to its close contact with the recurrent laryngeal nerve. As I mentioned earlier, cardiothoracic surgery, particularly if surgery is from the left side, can increase risk of nerve damage or severing. In fact, recent research by Plowman and colleagues shows that as much as 25% of patients will have some degree of vocal fold mobility impairment following surgery from the left side. Just as there are specific types of dysphagia caused by variances in heart anatomy, there's also a specific type of voice impairment caused by altered heart anatomy. You may or may not have heard of Ortner's syndrome, also known as cardiovocal syndrome. Ortner's syndrome is defined as a unilateral vocal fold paralysis resulting from left recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy secondary to enlarged cardiac structures causing nerve compression. The primary symptom is vocal hoarseness. When it comes to treatment, the underlying cause must be managed by the medical team. Voice therapy alone will not result in normal vocal function given the anatomical impact. SLPs may have a role in catching this early, which can improve outcomes. For example, patient may be referred to an SLP who specializes in voice, and a thorough case history paired with a nasoendoscopic examination of the vocal folds may lead to an initial concern for cardiovocal syndrome, prompting appropriate referrals. Sometimes, depending on your relationship with cardiothoracic surgeons and the hospital environment, it can be pretty challenging to order fees or endoscopic exams if you have a concern for post-operative nerve damage that could be impacting the patient's voice or airway protection. I've heard and seen several discussions among SLPs who work in the cardiovascular ICU, sharing their frustration around getting denied orders for fees or pushback when there's any mention of possible post-op nerve damage or laryngeal impairments. In order to improve chances of voice and dysphagia care in this population, it's important that SLPs earn the trust of the cardiothoracic team and prove their value. One SLP who's a member of the collective and has spent most of her career working in the cardiovascular ICU shared how she did this. She spent time being present and helpful, like assisting the patient repositioning and getting blankets or even simply typing her notes on the unit so people got to know her. She spent a lot of time learning their language. 
This SLP shared her personal experiences around feeling like the physicians and nurses could tell very quickly when she didn't understand the basics of cardiac units, the equipment, hemodynamics, and critical considerations for this fragile population. The more time she spent on the unit, learning their language, and even sharing research related to cardiothoracic surgery and voice and swallowing, the more trust she built. Eventually, the cardiothoracic surgeons were impressed by her contributions, and she was invited to provide a presentation to a room full of cardiothoracic specialists for a continuing medical education event. I'll be posting other videos just like this one that you won't want to miss, so make sure to hit that like and subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. Do you have any specific questions about cardiothoracic considerations for the SLP? Leave a comment below and tell me about it. We'll be sure to get your questions answered as soon as possible. Make sure to stick around to the end to claim a freebie or two. Number three, now let's talk about how cardiac conditions can impact cognition. Heart failure, cardiac arrest, cardiac procedures or surgery, and some common heart conditions such as atrial fibrillation can all result in some degree of cognitive impairment. This can be the result of decreased cerebral perfusion, either acute like cardiac arrest or chronic like chronic heart failure, or as a consequence of brain infarction after cardiac procedures or surgery. Studies have shown that global cognitive ability declines significantly faster in groups newly diagnosed with heart failure compared to groups without heart failure. When it comes to cardiac arrest, as much as 43% of individuals who have an out of hospital cardiac arrest will show some degree of cognitive dysfunction. The longer the cardiac arrest, the greater the risk of cognitive impairment. This is why it's important to look at what the time to return of spontaneous circulation was in the notes. Return of spontaneous circulation is defined as the time of the first recognizable cardiac rhythm compatible with cardiac output in absence of chest compressions. Literature particularly shows impairments in short-term memory, immediate recall, delayed recall, attention, and executive function. As for surgery, post-operative cognitive decline, POCD, has been linked to cardiac surgery in higher frequencies than other surgeries. While both POCD and delirium can produce similar symptoms, POCD usually occurs after the immediate post-operative days, has no effect on consciousness, and is likely to have a longer duration. Some proposed mechanisms of POCD in cardiac patients include lesions in the hippocampus, which is particularly sensitive to hypoxic injury, systematic inflammatory response after surgery, and effects of cardiopulmonary bypass. In some hospitals, the SLP department is part of the routine assessment process for LVAD candidacy. LVAD stands for left ventricular assist device. It's a battery operated mechanical pump that gets implanted into the heart and helps the left ventricle, which is the main pumping chamber of the heart, to pump blood to the rest of the body. This can be used as either a bridge to heart transplant therapy or as a long-term treatment for patients who aren't candidates for heart transplants. So why would an SLP need to assess cognition prior to this procedure? For several reasons. Life with an LVAD isn't passive. There's no set it and forget it process. As opposed to something like a pacemaker, an LVAD requires external devices that you must wear at all times. It requires memory and planning to make sure you have an adequate electrical supply, daily sterile dressing changes, and lifestyle restrictions like no swimming, bathtubs, hot tubs, no jumping or contact sports, and the constant presence of a power source. Adequate cognitive functioning or caregiver support is necessary to be a candidate for an LVAD. Research also shows that lower cognitive function is associated with higher hospital readmission rates post-LVAD surgery, and also trends towards worse survival. This video can only scratch the surface of cardiac considerations for the SLP, but hopefully it provides you with enough details to get your gears turning and motivate you to keep learning more about this important area of our field. If you haven't tuned in to the Swallow Your Pride podcast yet, make sure to check out episodes 201 and 211. Both of these episodes are dedicated to the SLP's role in cardiac care. I've also got a free gift for you over at metaslpcollective.com. You'll get instant access to our free MedSLP Collective Clipboard Kit. We have a robust and vibrant community of SLPs and mentors to help you out with your toughest clinical cases. Head over to MedSLPCollective.com now to get your hands on this. The link will be in the description below.